Good morning. Um, we welcome you this morning as we uh, seek to come together um, and worship our Heavenly Father. I um, wanted to let you know that we uh, um, have a, had a few problems with our streaming this morning. So if you find that uh, this group, the, uh, the message this morning, if you find that the, the YouTube freezes on you or um, um, you have other problems, uh, um, continue, consider restarting that um, or just hold on. Um, we're thinking that um, we can uh, have things work properly this morning as uh, um, even with just a couple of little interruptions if they were to occur. So um, to stay with that, and hopefully we'll be okay this morning. Um, look forward to our message this morning and um, ask that you would bow with me for a word of prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we come before your throne this morning. It is uh, our desire that uh, we might honor you and praise your name and uh, worship you with, uh, with uh, what spirit you have placed within our lives and within our hearts. When it uh, comes down to it, we have to know and to recognize that uh, you have made us and created us and that uh, you have done such wonderful things for us in our honor behalf, things that uh, we will probably never fully understand until we are with you, standing in your presence, and then we'll understand the magnitude and the breadth and the depth of what you have done for us. But even here on this on this earth, we can understand the, that we have fallen short, and we can understand that there is grace and we can understand in many ways that uh, your grace covers what we can't do. Your love is there despite our shortcomings. And uh, you know. You know what we go through. Because you have lived that life. And um, you know how to bring us back to you. And um, as we... As we seek to understand your son and uh, the words that he shared that came from you, we understand that there's a, a different road and a different walk that uh, you have placed before us that uh, then mankind would know without you. And you have called us to live lives that uh, are clean and holy and to seek you. And so we pray that uh, as we seek to be obedient to your word, to seek to honor a covenants that we have made with you, to follow you and to remember you, that you would continue to uh, lift us up, you would continue to give us strength, and that you would continue to remind us of those things that we can and should be about for you. And Lord, I pray that uh, as our brother Corey stands this morning, and seeks to uh, bring those words that have been placed upon his heart, things that have resonated within him as truth, that come from your throne and from your word. I pray that you would continue to uh, work within him, and uh, that your spirit would rest upon him, that he would be able to say and to express those things that uh, are important for your people to hear, and I pray that uh, within the heart of each that is listening this morning, that uh, our hearts would be softened, that we would be able to hear with your spirit, and that that spirit um, would touch the inner man within us so that we might understand truly what you want. So Lord, we thank you because we are here because of your love and we have, we have joy and have much to look forward to because of the promises that you have laid out before us. And so we uh, come before you this morning in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and it's his name we have this service this morning. Amen. Good morning. We open the word this morning from the third book of Nephi, chapter 4. And Jesus said, Behold, I have come into the world to bring redemption unto the world, to save the world from sin. 
Therefore, whoso repenteth and cometh unto me as a little child, him will I receive, for of such is the kingdom of God. Behold, for such I have laid down my life and have taken it up again. Therefore, repent and come unto me, ye ends of the earth, and be saved. The message this morning is all about a three-letter word called sin. As Jesus states, he came to bring redemption, to save the world from sin. I'd like to talk about what that means today. After Jesus shares these words from the third book of Nephi, it's interesting because of all the things that he could tell the people. Four times in the next page, he mentions one specific thing. He mentions chickens. <laughs> He says, how oft I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chickens, and that's repeated a few times. Well, I determined this morning that if Jesus could make a good point talking about chickens, I could tell you another story about my dogs. So we live in town, and uh, for the last many years, we've had two dogs, a big hunting golden retriever, a 150-pound dog. And my dog is bigger than my wife. And we have this little frou-frou dog, might be eight pounds, and she, of course, thinks she's in charge. But they're about as opposite as dogs could get. One's high-strung, one's mellow. And so because we live in town, and I take the dogs for walks frequently, it had been my practice um, to go sometimes places where they could be off-leash, away from people's homes in an area where it wouldn't bother anyone if they were able to run a little bit. So in one of these walks one time when I was away from the neighborhood and, and along a road where the dogs could just sniff and run ahead a little bit, I let them do that. And as the dogs were out, all of a sudden their noses caught wind of something farther ahead than I was, and they start trotting up the road. And I'm, I'm not really concerned about this until I see them go out in the road. And at this point, they're 50 yards probably away from me. And I'm not exactly sure why they're in the road, but I start running ahead only to see them wagging their tails. And as, as I'm looking out, the, the, the big dog is wagging his tail, and whatever's in the road, he decides he's not going to sniff it, but he's going to lay down in it, and he's going to roll in it. And the little dog is waiting her turn, and she's gleefully wagging her tail for him to get up so she can do the same, and she leans down and rubs her back all around and spins around and whatever it is. And when I get up to where this place is, that these dogs are just enjoying themselves, I find it's the remnants of what must have been a possum or something. And it was spread flatter than a pizza on the road. And it had been a hot summer time. And, and the stench from that was awful. And for some reason, now who knows why, I'm sure veterinarians would have their opinions. Dogs hearkening way back to something in their genetics tells them that if they roll in that stinky stuff, it will hide their scent from a would-be predator and they'll be safe. And so now I got to tell you, these dogs of ours live in the house and, you know, there's no mountain lions pr prowling around our, our property in town or anything. There's really, really no threat. But I can tell you this, those dogs were not coming back in the house smelling like dead, rotted possum, all right? But when I got home, of course, before they were going to come in the house, that stench had to be removed, right? Well, we have a problem. We have a problem that's a lot like these dogs. See, something in the dog's nature tells them it's okay to get in something that's awful, and, and find they think they're enjoying it. Find they almost think they need it. Our problem as humans in this world is that that tends to be our view of sin. You see, we are like these dogs where something in our nature, the scripture calls the natural man, our carnal state, separated from God, seems to find pleasure in the things that cause our souls to have stench and to smell and to be in a situation in this world where we cannot return to God because of that sin. 
See, now my dogs, all they took was a bath. All right, I, I washed them off, hosed them off, and of course, as soon as that happens, the big dog thinks he's got to go get that off him, so he goes out in the yard and rolls around on it. But <clears throat> where the problem for us is that we have this inclination as humans to live this life of sin, and it doesn't matter if you're male or female, or you're the custodian, or you're the CEO. We as humanity have been separated from God because of the presence of sin in our soul. And where God is, he says, no unclean thing can dwell in my presence. You see, our sin is the problem. This is why Jesus said, I've come to bring redemption to the world to save the world from sin. Because whether we understand it or not, it's the sin that we all have that has cut us off from God forever, <clears throat> unless that sin is removed. Now, unlike my dog, who had an owner who could come in and scrub them off and get them clean so they could come back in the house, we have no means within ourselves to remove this presence of sin. You see, the problem of all eternity and the reason for the redemption of Jesus is because of the fact that whether we knew it or not, our sin would forever separate us from God unless it would be removed. But the only way it could be removed was the very Savior, the very Creator, the Infinite One, had to make a sacrifice. And that sacrifice was done for us, finite creatures. He's infinite. We are worthless. And yet he chose to make the sacrifice to remove that barrier of sin. And it required the sacrifice of his own life. Now, our instinct would not otherwise tell us that sin has to be removed unless God would give us his word, unless God would give us this instruction. Unless God would tell us, no, you don't realize that you've been cast off, that you've been separated from me, and there's only one way to come back. The word of God teaches the only way to come back to him is through Jesus, that he is the one who can only has the power to remove sin. You know, over the years, I've done uh, different construction jobs, home building and wiring and plumbing and things like that are, are things I enjoy doing. Um, and if you've ever done any plumbing uh, in this day and age anyhow and work with PVC pipes, you, there's a method by which you know they're usually used for drain or they can be used for supply plumbing. But they're plastic pieces and they need to be joined together. And for that joining to happen, there's a certain solvent you have to use, and it's a very, very powerful chemical. And before that can be applied, you have to get the pipes really clean, and, and not just clean, but chemically open up the, the polymers of this PVC so that the joints will hold together like the molecules will bind together, right? It's, it's more than just Elmer's glue. But this PVC cleaner stuff tends to come in a bright color. And that's so plumbers can make sure they know they put it on before they put the glue on. Because if the PVC primer isn't there, it's kind of even more important than the glue. If you don't get clean first, well, it's, it's, the pipes aren't going to hold together. Well, one time I was wearing one of my favorite shirts that I did work in. It was just a sweatshirt, but I really liked it. And I was doing some plumbing overhead, and this PVC pipe had a bunch of this purple primer. And it's a strong chemical. It smells strong, you know, kind of like turpentine in it. And it, if it gets on something, it's there to stay. And well, a whole bunch of this PVC primer, purple stuff, fell on my light gray sweatshirt. And suddenly I was the polka dot boy. I was, had purple polka dots all over my shirt. And I, I love this shirt, and I wasn't going to get rid of it for any reason because of that. You know, i just keep wearing it. So it became kind of my plumbing shirt. And then one day, I couldn't find the shirt. And I'm like, honey, have you seen my, I asked my wife, have you seen my, my shirt? I love it. She goes, well, I got rid of it. And I'm like, you got rid of it? Why did you get rid of my shirt? It's like, you know, wives aren't supposed to do that, you know. And, and she's, well, like, I tried and tried, and I couldn't get the stain out. 
I'm like, well, I didn't get there. I, I, she goes, no, but you don't understand that. I was worried you might go out in public like that, right? And so, you know, that was just kind of a little joke between her and I that she was more worried about me wearing that in public. But, but our problem and my problem is I've got a bigger problem than just stained shirts where the stains can't come out. And in fact, had this not been a, a place of respect and a pulpit, maybe if we'd been at a youth camp or something today, I would have worn a similar shirt because I've got a few of them now. Our souls are stained more than that PVC primer that's embedded into my, the cotton fabric of my clothing. You see, our souls have this stain that we have no means to remove. There is nothing within us capable, no matter how many times we'd say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. There was no way the sin could be removed unless a sacrifice was made. And what, it took more than just us saying we're sorry, or more than we're saying we have to go back with God. God said, no, you don't understand that it isn't just a matter of you saying, hey, I wish I could go back, I wish I could be with you now, I'll be good again. No, the sin had an infinite cost. And so to remove the sin took an infinite payment. It took the payment of the everlasting God, the infinite God, on our behalf, the sinless for the sinful, to remove that stain of sin. You see, when we stand before God one day, there's going to be two groups of people. And this Book of Mormon simply teaches this. He said, see, our final state is to dwell in the kingdom of God or to be cast out. And so, so people are either going to return fully God or they're not going to be with God. And, and there's no in-between. There's a left hand of God and there's a right hand of God. And he says this, the difference between these two groups of people, between you and me and all humanity, is going to be this. Not, not our job, not our last name, not who our parents were, our status in life, but whether our sin was removed or not. And you see, the way sin is removed, the scriptures teach, is very clear. It's why we have scripture. It's to teach us that there's only one condition that allows the sin to be removed. First, there had to be a perfect sacrifice. And then with that, we had to respond to the sacrifice. And the response to the sacrifice is that our heart, which is carnal, which likes to roll in the stink of this world, has to decide... By, by the mental, spiritual, emotional powers that God gave us because we were created in his image to think, we have to decide that we want him instead of the stink of the world, right? That's what life comes down to. And if, if our heart, which means our mind, our will, our, our, our being, the, the purpose for which we live our life, if that changes, then that opens the door so which, by which grace, this gift can be applied. You see, there will be two groups of people, and for those who came to him and said, you know, I was sorry about my sin. I realized there was nothing I could do except I called upon you. You see, those people are the ones who are broken and contrite. And he says to you, I can remove your sin. But to the others who said, I had wanted nothing to do with you, or I heard about you, and I thought, oh, that was foolish, and I didn't have any desire to do anything other than to live in this world of sin, he says, to you, I can't do anything for you. Because as the scriptures teach, this requirement that our heart change is the requirement. And if our hearts don't change, he said, mercy cannot rob justice. Mercy, my, my ability to bring you back to heaven is limited. I can't just open the door unless your heart changes. That's the condition. Our sin is apparent and present. Our sin can't be removed by anything we can do. Our sin can be removed if our heart changes and we look to God and call upon him for mercy. That opens the door whereby he says, and now this eternal payment can cancel your sin. And we're either in one group on the one hand or we're in the other group on the other. And that's where all humanity is divided. See, that's what this gospel, that's what this Book of Mormon specifically teaches.
teaches. That is the message that was restored so that the Gentiles of this day, so that we of the church would not stumble at any other doctrine or confuse it with any other message. That God came to offer a sacrifice that was the only eternal payment possible so that the door of his kingdom could be opened back to us again so that we could be welcomed back to sit down with the Father and with the Holy Ones and with the ones who prepared the way for us by, by living and giving us these words, who lived and died so that we could know salvation. See, it's the only thing that separates all of humanity. Was your sin removed or was it not? Now, there was a lot that the people's people of Scripture had to say. Um, but I'd like to tell you one more thing. I um, have to travel for work, and I was probably going to have to travel tomorrow. And then I, I just thought, you know, I, I do it off. I, I check the weather kind of like, I just like knowing about the weather like you all probably. And I looked at the weather report this morning, and I realized, you know, there's some, some weather coming our way, and it's only October. And I was kind of caught off surprised. I hadn't paid attention for a couple of days. It caught off guard with that. And because it said hazardous outlook. So I clicked on this hazardous outlook for our, our area here in the Midwest and it made this statement. It said this. This is for, for right now, today. Record gold is forecast for Tuesday morning, so day after tomorrow, with temperatures falling into the mid-teens to 20s, providing the first hard freeze, and get this, and effectively ending the growing season. See, within two days, within two days right now, if, if there were still crops in someone's field, guess what? They're going to be dead. If you have pansies in your planter that are looking green and thriving today, you know what? They're going to be wilted and falling over two days from now. Two days from now. You see, we have been told in Scripture that it's just like this hard freeze, the effective end of the growing season, the effective end of our life. We don't know when that is. It's something we really have little control over. But we know that for all of us, there will be a time when our hearts stop beating, we stop breathing, and our time on this earth is done. And if we haven't in this time come to the Lord and decided that, you know what, you were more important than my sin, that your word was the thing I needed to follow, not the words of the world. If, if we don't come to this point where we recognize the need for a Savior and that it, he is God and not ourselves, then the growing season of our life is effectively going to end and we will not be changed. See, this is what the scriptures teach us about. This is, they, they give us a hope to look forward to for salvation, but they give us a warning that the growing season is effectively going to end for all of us. And so what do we do in the meantime? You see, our day will end, and we don't want to be the ones who stand before God someday and hear the words, you know what? There is nothing I can do for you. Because the scriptures teach, and the Book of Mormon again says, hey, if God breaks his own laws then God would even cease to be God. And he said, don't think that you get any other um, pass or benefit or that I'm just going to wink and look the other way and, and let you go and do your thing because oh, I just kind of liked you a little better. No, he said, everyone has to come through this gate. And the keeper of the gate is the Holy One of Israel. That's God. He said, he employs no servant there. He's the one who guards the gate. He lets everyone in or out. And it's based on if our heart changed to recognize our sin and to call upon him for his mercy. And then a door can open. I can remember when I was young once, I used to have to ride the bus on occasion in elementary school, and I got on the bus one day after school, and, uh, and I was no sooner on the bus, and I saw my mom's car driving up, and I thought, why is she driving up? I'm riding the bus home today, and then I remembered, I had like a dentist appointment or something, <clears throat> immediately after school, there wouldn't have been time to take the bus home and then have my mom take, so she was going to pick me up from school, but because I was already on the bus, and the rules for the bus system at the time, and they're probably even worse now or more strict, was that <clears throat> once you're on the bus, you couldn't get let off until you're at your bus stop at home. And if that happened, I was going to miss my dental appointment. And this nice man who had been the bus driver since before I was going to school, 
I, my mom kind of comes to the bus and says, well, Corey needs to get off. And I'm like, I'm right here, and I forgot I was supposed to go. And the nice bus driver said, I'm not supposed to let you off the sun off. And if, and if I say that I saw you get off, I could lose my job. So I'm just going to look the other way, and I'm just going to look out the window here, and you just take care of your business. And while he looks the other way, I get off the bus and go with my mom. Now, he was being a nice man to let that happen. But you know what? That's not how mercy works. God said it isn't that way. It isn't that, oh, you didn't, you didn't understand about your sin or you didn't ever care to change your heart. Um, he said, I can't do anything for you. The scriptures say if God does that, God would cease to be God, right? And, and he's like, get this now. Understand it now. He said, I have to operate by the same rules, but I'm explaining them as simply as possible, says, says Jesus. He says, I have come to bring redemption to the world, to save you from your sin, if you will come to me and you'll repent. That's what it comes down to. That is this beautiful message of this gospel we've been given. You know, um, <clears throat> when we stand before God, and if our sin is remitted, the scripture teaches, you know, a beautiful thing happens. The scripture teaches we will have memory of that sin no more. I mean, the, this life is behind us. Um, it's not even going to really come to mind, which you think, why risk anything, right? Why enjoy anything in this world that would separate me from God if for whatever pleasure I think is so great right now that I wouldn't even remember it in the life to come, right? But the opposite's true for people whose sin isn't remitted. Scripture teaches you'll stand before God, and all you will feel is this growing guilt and pain of your sin. And it isn't God doing it to you. It's because you would feel more pain and anguish with your sin being in the presence of God than you would be with, as the Scripture states, the damned souls in hell. That's from Mormon's words, chapter 463. He said, you would feel a lot better suffering in anguish than you would with sin in God's presence. He said, that would be bad. He said, but what you're going to find out is that there is no escape from your guilt for eternity. And this is what God's warned us of. The presence of sin is a problem right now that's kind of masked because we live in these physical bodies and they do a good job of of masking pain. You know, we, we might do something that we know is wrong, and then we kind of feel bad about it for a while. But then life goes on, a few days or weeks go by, and kind of, oh, yeah, I did that, but I, I don't feel like so bad about it anymore, right? And so Jesus is letting us know that doesn't happen anymore when you get an eternal body, because everyone is going to live for eternity, realize it or not. The problem is if you live with eternity, in eternity, for eternity, with sin in your soul, you can never escape it. And never escape the feeling of it, the pain of it, the guilt of it, the anguish of it. And that becomes your destiny. And that's why, as the Book of Mormon clearly teaches, it says your agony and your pains will be as a lake fire, right? It'll be, it torments your soul and there's no escape. This is what Jesus is warning us about. So he said, you would wish... As Alma 9.25 says, we would be glad at that point if we could command the rocks and the mountains to fall on us, right? To hide us from his presence, right? That's what it's going to feel like for people whose sin was not removed, that they will want so much to hide and escape. And he's like, no, and you don't get that luxury either, right? So, so... So why is this important? Well, you know, um, as we were visiting just a little bit before the sermon, you know, there, for the hard things that are happening in this life right now in the day and age we live in, uh, unrest and uncertainty, um, God has told us to not fear. And, he, and one of the reasons why we shouldn't fear, especially as the church that uh, he has placed this word back within, is for this reason. He said, you know what, there's a day coming. There's a day coming when people who I have made promises to through covenants that are alive on the earth right now and their families have been part of this earth story for generations, he said, I'm going to fulfill those promises and I'm going to take my word, which we have the luxury of holding in our hands right now, this precious word from the perfect God, 
He said, no matter what you guys do with it, he said, I'm going to take it back to people who have yet to hear. It was their forefathers who wrote it, right? Scattered tribes of Israel. He said, I'm going to take this word back to them. And he said, you know what? When they hear this word, there's going to be a cry that goes forth. And in 3 Nephi chapter 9, around verse 79, it says, then a cry is going to go forth from among these people who have yet to hear the word. And it's going to say, depart ye, depart ye, go out from thence, and don't touch that which is unclean. In other words, there's going to be a change in the hearts of God's people someday when they're going to recognize the sin in the world and they're going to say, I don't want anything to do with it, right? See, that day is coming. Despite the unrest and the uncertainty that we see all around us, God said, no, there's a powerful day coming, a day of power where the people of who have been part of my covenant forever, who have been drowning in unbelief and whose homes, as the scriptures say, in their spiritual sense, have been desolate for generations because they've had a void, and that void is Jesus Christ in their life. He said, no, they're going to come, and they're going to find out about me, and they're going to find out about the sin that we're talking about today, and they're going to say, we don't want anything to do with it anymore, Lord. Change our hearts. You know, what are these wounds in your hands and and they're going to say he said these are where i got pierced by my friends and they're going to weep over him because they realized that he was the messiah and he was the only one who could remove our sin and at that they will respond and they will turn and they will go out and they will be clean it says it will be clean that bear the vessels of the lord see and the world is going to see a change someday this is what the prophetic part of this word tells us about sin. There is going to be righteousness and truth that wells up among God's people. And it's not some magical mystery that we have yet to uncover. It's the simple, plain truth that the hearts of people become determined to change. And when that change happens, they can do new things for Christ. They can do powerful things the world has never seen. And that is the day that is coming. He says, for this cause, he will fulfill these words he's given, and he lies not, but he fulfills all his words, and he's promising, he says, because no unclean thing can enter his kingdom. So in a day to come, the world is going to find a people who live in this world, and, and not in a, in a legalistic, like the Pharisees sort of mode do they live, but in a, in a humble way. In a, in, a, in a state of being broken and contrite in a good way where they realize it's because of our Savior that we have hope, not because of ourselves. And when this day happens, you know, people aren't going to roll in the spiritual stinky possum anymore, right? His people. There's going to be, the scriptures say, there's going to be, you're going to see the world's divided before the day of judgment. He said two, two, day, two hands, you know, left and a right of the day of judgment. He said, well, in the end, there's going to be two churches he said, you're going to have the church of Christ, those who've come to him and whose hearts are broken, or you have the church of the devil, the one who fights against your change of heart, right, who wants to make God's word void. And he said, at this time, he said, in the day to come, he said, guess what? Your righteousness through me will be stronger in power than the evil of the adversary. And the righteous will overcome, right? That's when his, his kingdom is set up. That's when he manages the, uh, the effort of his world work and his word to go to the world. These are the things we have to look forward to, but they come to no one unless we become determined to be like this, to touch not that which is unclean, right? And, and this is where I'm standing here with a spotted soul, uh, just like my, my T-shirt covered with purple primer, that it can't be removed unless I appeal to him. And I can't be satisfied to live my life saying, well, I'll sin a little and he'll forgive me. I'll sin a little and he'll forgive me. Well, you know, he might forgive you, but in our lives, we'll never be anything more effective than just a sinner who kind of gets it right now and then. You know, but he wants more than that of us. He says this. He says, Mormon chapter 4, verse 94, he guides us. If we want to taste that kingdom, if we want to taste that presence of his power here on this earth, he says, be wise in the days of your probation. 
Strip yourselves of all uncleanness and ask not that you might consume it on your lust, you know, your life. Can I have a life full of lust, please, Lord? Can I just have things that make me feel good all the time? He said, but ask with a firmness unshaken that you will yield to no temptation and that you will serve the true and living God. And again, I would exhort you that you would come unto Christ and lay hold of every good gift and touch not the evil gift nor the evil thing, or the unclean thing. You know, I came across some words by Alma, and um, I probably say this every sermon. Every time I pick up the Book of Mormon, it's just feeling like a new book to me. I, I, I find words and comfort, and, and um, sometimes passages, and I'm like, man, I don't know that I've ever even read this before, but this spoke to my sentiment. Because I stand as a sinner. I can't point a finger at any of you. We're in this together, right? We have a problem of sin that can only be removed by our Creator. There's nothing within us to remove it. And, and I find that the sentiment expressed by Alma speaks the words of my soul. And I would like to share his words, which I believe will be our words someday when we stand before the Savior. And this is from uh, Alma 14, verse 90. 7 through 101. Behold, who can glory too much in the Lord? Who can say too much of his great power and of his mercy and of his long suffering toward the children of men? Behold, I say unto you, I cannot say the smallest part which I feel. Who could have supposed that our God would have been so merciful as to have snatched us from our awful and sinful polluted state? See, he's, he's saying, who, who would have thought God would have done this for us? We didn't deserve it. We were awful and polluted. And remember who Alma is. This Alma speaking, he's the one who, when his dad was the, the preacher of town, was the son trying to destroy the church. This is coming from that guy, right? And Alma says, behold, we, he and his buddies, went forth even in wrath with mighty threatenings, to destroy his church. You know, these, these were not just kids who just kind of pulled pranks in the back row of the church. They had an agenda to destroy God's work, right? They wanted to see it dismantled. They, it wasn't just like something that, oh, I'm not into church. No, they were fighting against it. This is his soul. And he says, behold, we went forth in wrath with threatenings to destroy his church. Oh, then why did he not consign us to an awful destruction? Why didn't God give us what we deserved and just write us off and say, no, to hell with you, right? I mean, that's kind of what the answer is. You're going to hell, and that's what we think God says, but you know what God's answer really is? He said, no, I came because I don't want any of you to suffer what the scriptures call hell. He says, I'm trying to save you from that because you don't realize you'll do that to yourself. Your own sin will create this condition that is so awful. The only word for it is hell. He said, no, I don't want to send you to hell. That's not my point. My point is to save you from that. And Alma says, why didn't he send us there? Why didn't he send us to hell to an awful destruction? Because that's what we deserved. He says, yea, why did he not let the sword of his justice fall upon us and doom us to eternal despair. O oh, my soul, almost as it were, fleeth at the thought. But behold, and here's the love of our Savior. Behold, he did not exercise his justice, justice upon us, but in his great mercy hath brought us over that everlasting gulf of death and misery, even to the salvation of our souls. Despite the evil in our hearts, he reached out and carried us over what have been our doom and our destiny. He says, no, come back to me. I want you to be with me. See, how will we, how, we can't fathom that. We can't fathom because Alan's story is our story or will be our story someday when we realize. How isn't, he didn't just cut us all off and says, you're not worth it. He's like, no, but you are, each one of you. I I have a place for you. I want to share with you. I don't want to spend eternity away from you. I'm willing. I'd made this sacrifice 
so that you could come to me so that your sin can be removed. Now, will you? So the growing season's going to end. And this Savior of ours knows that, knows that. He's warned us ahead. But he's given us hope, and he's given us truth, and he's let us know, he, he's let us know his plan from the beginning, right? He says, Verily I say unto you, this is from the third book of Nephi, chapter 4 again, as Jesus introduces himself to the ancient Americans. He says, um, Will you not now return unto me and repent of your sins and be converted that I might heal you? I'm offering, I'm offering. Verily I say unto you, if you will come unto me, you shall have eternal life. Behold, my arm of mercy is extended to you. And whosoever will come, him will I receive. And blessed are they which come unto me. Amen. Josh is going to close us out in prayer. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we come to you this time and we give you thanks. Lord, we give you thanks that um, even through the hard times right now that we still have the opportunity to uh, come before the throne, by, before your throne and um, offer those things up to you. Lord, I ask that um, we may take those things that we've heard today. And Lord, that um, we may have that taste of your kingdom. That we may not allow those sins to bear us down and, and keep us down. For Lord... It was for you that made that sacrifice for us, that we may be forgiven. Lord, I ask that uh, you be with us, that we may know we're forgiven, that we may continue to hold on to that rod of iron that leads to you, Lord. That, Lord, those things that are happening in the world right now that we know we don't have control of, for we know you're in control, for you know the beginning, you know the end. Just like you know every star's name in the sky. Lord, I ask that, um, that your angels would uh, continue to watch over us. That you would continue to pre protect us both physically and spiritually, Lord. Lord, I ask that um, while we go throughout this week, that your spirit would continue to guide us. That each day we may be able to wake up ready to praise your name and go about our business. Lord, we just give you thanks and praise, and I pray all these things in the most precious name, even Jesus Christ. Amen.